an amazing pleasure, an amazing honor to be here. Thank you. Thank you for the honor you show my work with your invitation to deliver the Neutmeer Auschwitz lecture and your selection of me to receive the Anna Tiefels Kupferschmidt Award. I am grateful to the Dutch Auschwitz Committee, the Niod Institute for War, Holocaust, and Genocide Studies, and the Social Insurance Bank. I am thankful to you, Mariana, and to you, Nancy, and to everyone. Most particularly, I thank everyone present for your interest in and your commitment to remembrance and commemoration. My talk this, if, this afternoon draws upon my current project, a book about American relief and rescue workers. Few of the Americans who hurtled into action on behalf of the victims of the Nazis and their allies, few of them are known today. Not even now, when we face the greatest refugee crisis since the Nazi era, and when exemplars of international rescue action would prove useful. I will introduce a couple of them to you. You will see that women figured prominently in these initiatives. Philanthropy and service had long been women's work, but this philanthropy and the overseas assignments offered imagined, offered unimagined avenues for independent action. And their experiences changed them their work was transformative, transformative for those they managed to help and for them too. My project therefore pays particular attention to gender and it also plums the role of the unpredictable and the irrational. Historians have traditionally focused on social class, occupation, religion, race, age, and gender. But they've shied away from the unpredictable, the importance of timing, luck, which you mentioned, Jacques, the luck, chance, fortuitous circumstance. We historians don't know what to do with those factors, and so we just don't do much. An example to illustrate my point. Hannah Starkman, then aged about 12, was with her mother and brother Henek in the German-imposed ghetto in the Polish city of Radom. One night, we heard shooting. We went to the window and we saw people running and German soldiers shooting. We got dressed, and then a couple of minutes later, we heard German soldiers in the building yelling, raus, raus, raus. So we all went out, and there were masses of people in the street. You could go either to the right or to the left into the middle of the street. We stood there for, I don't know, maybe half an hour. And then they told us to go back into the apartment house. We didn't know what happened. We found out later. Radom had two ghettos, a small ghetto on one side of town and the bigger ghetto where we were in another part of town. The Germans sent out everyone from the small ghetto to the annihilation camp Treblinka that night. They had a few cars, those cattle cars, train cars left. So they needed some more people to fill the cars. So they got all the people from the big ghetto out on the street 
and they counted how many people they needed. So some of our neighbors who, when they left the building, went to the right, were sent to Treblinka that night. And we, because we went to the left, we were not sent. The luck of the draw. So later on, when my brother came home from work and my neighbor's son came, he didn't find his mother and sister. My brother found us. It was just one of those things. I am not minimizing the importance of ideology, policy, and practice. Were it not for ideology, policy, and practice, Hannah would not have been in that situation at all. But at that very moment, luck and fortuitous circumstance shaped her fate. With this project, I tackle the even messier role of the irrational. Our Americans were operatives of improbable courage, resourcefulness, and resilience. They were fueled by principles, to be sure. But they were fueled, too, by personal and professional ambition eagerness to actualize their potential, a taste for adventure, and frustration with limitations. Social ties counted a lot with them. Emotions played a great role, too, as did irrational decisions, spurring actions, movement. In sum, I hope to persuade you to take very seriously the factors, fortuitous circumstances, timing, emotions, that we know shape our own lives, but we ignore in our analyses of the past. Recognizing and acknowledging the role of the unpredictable and the irrational prompts us to imagine history as a time as full and rich as our own everyday lives. It reframes the way we think about, analyze, and write history. I do not marginalize the factors already identified as significant. By contrast, I wish to add another lens to introduce a new turn in Holocaust scholarship, the role of the unpredictable and the irrational. And now, two cases to illustrate. Prague, 1939. Martha and Wait Still Sharp stepped off a train into Prague's Wilson Station on a cold February day in 1939. Selected by the Unitarian leadership in Boston to travel to Czechoslovakia, they were charged with aiding the quarter million refugees who had fled from Sudetenland into Bohemia and Moravia as a result of the Munich Agreement. That agreement galvanized the American Unitarian Association also called the AUA, galvanized them. Please note, when the Germans had marched into Austria half a year earlier, no one had jumped into action. The assault on Czechoslovakia, by contrast, triggered action. In 1938, Czechoslovakia was home to a small, Unitarian community. But ties of kinship and friendship abounded between Unitarians in the United States and Czechoslovakia. And those bonds shaped the AUA response. 
I have just listened to the news broadcast from Prague in regard to the Czech crisis. One Howard Matson wrote to AUA President Frederick Elliott. We Unitarians have so many connections with our fellows in Czechoslovakia that we have a special obligation for action. So personal relationships clearly trigger, triggered a swift response. So did another emotion, rivalry. The Quakers had a service committee, so could the Unitarians. We are a body somewhat larger than the Quakers. We are a body that is at least as wealthy as the Quakers. And for almost a quarter of a century, the Quakers have pioneered in this feeling of field of dealing with people in distress. Robert Dexter, director of the AUA Department of Foreign Relations, pointed out to the board of directors. The Quakers' service work augmented their stature. The Unitarians could develop a public profile too. The AUA board agreed and dispatched that very same Robert Dexter to Europe. He was joined by Robert Wood, a Philadelphia Quaker. Refugees crowded into Prague Many needed to emigrate immediately, Dexter and Wood reported. To the best they could ascertain, 92,000 refugees have registered from Sudetenland and Silesia, and the estimates are that there are over 150,000 more scattered in private homes and small villages who have not registered. Jews, in particular, sought to make themselves invisible. They fear if they register as refugees, they will be expelled from the country, Dexter and Wood explained. And where would they go? Faced with this assessment, the Unitarian leadership did not delay. They looked for a minister and his wife to serve as field representatives of a new commission for service in Czechoslovakia. According to Martha, 17 pastors, all men at that time, and their wives were approached. All declined. She and Waitstill were the 18th couple, and they accepted they sailed for Europe two weeks later. She was 33, he was 37. They took $41,000 in relief funds with them. And they left their two-year-old daughter, Martha Content, and their seven-year-old son, Hastings, with family friends. Wade still wanted Martha as his partner in this endeavor, and she wished to undertake the work. Still, parting with her children stood contrary to gender role norms and hinted at an ambition to make her mark beyond the home. The Sharps faced grave challenges. Reports from Czechoslovakia had alerted them to the increasingly desperate situation of refugees pouring into the city and, more ominously, of Gestapo infiltration and unexplained individual disappearances. Arriving in Prague, the Sharps' primary goal was relief helping to feed and clothe thousands of people. Emigration of persons at risk loomed large, too. With the help of trilingual Czech students, Martha processed dossiers of people needing to escape, particularly German Social Democrats and Jews. The situation grew urgent 
after the Germans marched into Prague on March 15. The Einmarsch, the invasion, was a turning point. Germany jammed BBC transmissions. There were no newspapers. The Sharps, like many others, were subject to constant surveillance on the street and elsewhere. The couple's focus shifted. With the German occupation, our entire project had to be changed with the main emphasis on emigration, they reported. But whom to help? This question plagued relief and rescue workers throughout the Nazi era. We are a service committee, not a major relief organization, Robert Dexter emphasized. Please bear in mind what has been our major aim from the beginning, naming, namely the salvaging of worthwhile people who are in danger in Europe because of their democratic attitudes. Or, as Waite still put it, these then were to be snatched from the burning. Intellectuals, editors, social workers, professors, clergymen, research specialists, lawyers, physicians, whose political record make it necessary for them to flee. The Unitarians' mission was clear in principle. Save leaders, Jewish or Gentile, with liberal values who would return to their countries of origin when the Third Reich fell and rebuild democratic states. They were the worthwhile people. Mostly male, universally well-educated, predominantly middle class. But life on the ground widened the Sharps' focus. And when an opportunity opened, not 10 days after the Einmarsch, to lead a convoy of 35 desperate people to safety in London, Martha took ownership instantly. Friday, March 24, 1939. Wait still was in Brussels when Tessa Roundtree, an English Quaker representing the British Committee for Refugees from Czechoslovakia, that's BCRC, tapped Martha to conduct a group of refugees traveling to England. Their papers were in order. The adults had British visas identifying them as domestic workers, and they had German exit permits, Ausreise. Roundtree would accompany some 50 on a train departing at 4 o'clock in the afternoon. Would Martha take the rest at 4.30? Martha was an American and a minister's wife. These were factors in her favor. She did not have an Ausreise, but as she had arrived before March 15, she could get one locally. She did not need to apply to Berlin. Martha understood that the mission was fraught with danger and risk. I knew that the household workers included some of the most wanted politicals, ardent and well-known anti-Nazis. If the Gestapo would charge us with assisting enemies of the state to escape, prison would be a light sentence. Torture and death were the usual punishment. But, she calculated, saving endangered people seemed worth the risk. Rescue initiatives depended upon many factors, luck, chance, fortuitous circumstances, trustworthy persons, timing. Martha raced against the clock to get the papers she needed. She turned to the US legation 
which phoned the Gestapo on her behalf to ask for exit and re-entry visas. The officer agreed to issue them in 10 days. Martha hurried to the Gestapo office to press the process forward in person. It was closed for lunch. The doors opened again at 2 o'clock, but she had to wait for a superior officer. Martha finally got the documents signed at 3.30. I had just time to get back to the office, pick up some papers, and leave a note for wait still explaining that I was going to London with Tessa's refugees. A Czech colleague caught her at the door and, learning that she was about to leave for England, asked her to take on another clandestine task. The colleague's mother needed an operation, and the sale of her jewelry abroad would cover the costs. Suitcase in tow and jewelry in her traveling case, Martha arrived at the station where she found one Miss Bull, the BCRC secretary, compiling a list of convoy participants as they appeared. She used a fountain pen filled with green ink. It was borrowed from one of the men standing near her. Now often, Nazi targets came out of hiding just in time to board a departing train. And indeed, in this case, two newsmen one from the United Press, the other from the Associated Press, jumped on at the last minute. Martha's charges occupied one train car. The journey proceeded fitfully. Finally nearing the Dutch border, the convoy was ordered to disembark for customs inspection. Martha's belongings were given only a cursory glance the jewels went undetected. But the Germans robbed the refugees of all of their valuables, even their wedding rings off their fingers, Martha fumed. Waiting to ensure everyone got back on the train, she heard a cry from the rear of the customs shed. I ran back and opened the door before the guards could stop me. There were the newspaper men, stripped to their waists, bags ripped apart. She spied a letter bearing an official U.S. seal. This letter puts this man under my protection as an American citizen, she thundered. You see the seal of the United States? Then waving Miss Bowles' notes in the air, she declared, they are all on my list. Against all odds, she prevailed, and the newsmen were allowed to rejoin the group. The train soon reached the border, and Martha surrendered Miss Bowles' list to the Dutch officials to check against the refugees visas, and passports. But having jumped on the train at the last minute, the newsmen had not been registered by the BCRC secretary. The Dutch authorities barred their entry. Martha reached for a solution. I ran along the car looking for the doctor with the pen filled with green ink. With the pen, I wrote the names of the men on the reverse side of the list. And just before the train was to pull out, I found the passport officer. He quizzed her. I'm sure the names were not there before. But she insisted, and they were allowed to board. It was the second near disaster, and she marveled such a thin line, line between life and death. 
Were it not for German policy, ideology, and actions on the ground, there would not have been a convoy. And social class, age, gender, religion, and profession were key factors in determining who was in the group. Still, training a close eye on this rescue initiative as it unfolded yields additional information. It makes visible what is obscured in the larger picture, the role of the unpredictable. The fortuitous circumstance first of the letter with an official American government seal, and then of that unusual green ink saved those newsmen and enabled them to proceed. The chance factors of a seal and of green ink, in short, afforded the margin of credibility the situation required. If rescue initiatives turned on unpredictable factors such as fortuitous circumstances and timing, they also turned on irrational prompts. Within a fortnight of the Einmarsch, Martha had chosen to put herself in danger in order to save lives. She knew what she risked and the possible consequences. It was a principled decision. And it was an impulsive decision, spurred by loathing for the Nazi regime and appreciation for bold action. Shortly after Martha returned from London, the Germans summarily evicted the Sharps and their staff from their offices. Undaunted, undaunted by the sight of their files and furnishings on the ground, Martha, Wade still was in Paris, soon found new quarters and resumed operations. The staff she had hired continued to work with her. Comprising four young Jewish couples, they interviewed clients and identified people with a special claim to Unitarian support. Students at all levels of the humanities in the great historic Charles University began to turn up, seeking aid to get out of the country, Waite still recalled. Young intellectuals. In Waitstill's estimation, this may have been the most valuable sing single thing the staff did before their martyrdom at the hands of the Nazis. Waitstill was wrong. Those four young couples were not martyred. They were murdered. No one saved those young people and they could not save themselves. The Jewish staff all went to the gas chambers, every one of them, including one couple, the Vellers, who had passports, but young Mr. Vellers, middle initial, middle initial D, had been incorrectly recorded as O. And that discrepancy prompted the British government to deny him entry. But back to the spring and summer of 1939, the staff identified those likely to make a cultural contribution if we could save their lives. To that end, Wade still granted 10,000 crowns to each young person in his words, fleeing now simply because Germans considered Cheho a vast concentration camp. Their clandestine escape route took them to the coal fields of Moravska Ostrava, where they sought out the tipples, great steel structures with wheels atop that signaled the entrance into a mine. The young people descended and there, below ground, met with Polish student resistors. The Czechs took
took off their clothes and put on the uniform of a Polish railway or postal worker. And then they walked underground through the main mine galleries until they passed the Polish border. Exiting into Poland, they were taken to the seaport of Gdynia and spirited onto British submarines. And landing in England, they were greeted by the British Army, Navy, and Air Force recruiting officers. Little time remained for the Sharps' mission. They were due to return to the US in August, and other foreign refugee organizations had received official termination notices. Wade still left to speak to a youth conference in Switzerland on August 8. Martha remained in Prague, winding up her emigration cases until a friend sent her a message advising her immediate departure. I have heard that you are to be arrested on Wednesday. She left on Tuesday. And she learned later that the Gestapo did in fact come to arrest her the following day. According to the AUA, Martha had handled the emigration of 3,500 families. But we will never know the precise number or what percentage managed to escape and then to survive the war. Martha and Waitstill's efforts proved transformative. They saved lives through their legal and clandestine emigration aid. Martha and Waitstill were changed too. Martha's tenure in Prague was but the beginning of a previously unimagined professional trajectory. Waitstill broached the prospect of Martha's possible opportunities with her. You will be returning from this experience abroad with, I believe, a good deal of prestige, he predicted. At the same time, he asked her to take a short break from the work that earned her this esteem in order to go on holiday with him in Switzerland. But her emotional center rested on rescue activities. Writing to Wait Still, she admitted, somehow I seem to have dried up spiritually in every other good way, but I send you my best, such as it is. Wait Still held little hope that Martha would agree to join him, but he pressed her again anyway. Now the time has come to finally decide whether or not you are going to Arsenio. There's no use making a reservation if you are intending to stay by your refugees. My darling wait still, I am terribly lonely without you, she replied. I think that the experience here has made me realize how much I love you. We need more quiet times together when we aren't really rushed to death by the clock. Somehow, we've got to begin to tell the world where it gets off. She didn't, nor did he. I front forward through the war and their work in France and Portugal, their individual decisions to leave the Unitarian Service Committee, to the Democratic Party's invitation to Martha to run for a House of Representatives seat in 1946. At that point, Martha was in Massachusetts with the children, but often on the road as a key fundraising speaker for Hadassah and Youth Aliyah. Wait still had returned to post-war reconstruction in Prague. I can't see much prospect of rootage 
with the family in the mad glare and dash of public life, he wrote her. Perhaps none of the rest of you three, that's Martha Hastings and Martha Content, perhaps none of the rest of you three wants any rootage, but I suspect that two out of the three of you do, and want it with thoughts too deep for tears. Seven years ago this hour, you and I were getting off the train here in Prague's Wilson Station, and all our world has been different ever since. I don't believe that you have ever taken in the continuously sinking feeling that beset the parsonage when you were headed outward. It was so real you could have weighed it. We finally could not count on any time when you wouldn't be off to a talk, or a tea, or a committee meeting, or across the continent. There have been times here in Prague when I have been almost desperate between the amount of work to do and the loneliness. I can't touch a woman. I see nothing but men's things in my wardrobe. I smell no perfume. Seven years ago tonight, we stepped off the train into Wilson Station and into a new world. Their marriage limped on for another eight years. Martha and Waitstill divorced in 1954. Many husbands and wives divorce, even in 1954. My point is that this particular couple divorced because of the ways in which Martha's experiences had changed her. She had outgrown her role of the minister's wife. Thank you.